We have uh, Messier 55, otherwise known as NGC 6809. There it is, it's a globular cluster. It's got the defining feature of all globular clusters, which is it's a cluster and it's globular. In other words, it's round. It's actually uh, one of the most southern of the Messier objects. It's a declination of minus 30 degrees, so it's actually you know, uh, above a latitude of minus 30, which means it's quite hard to see from the northern hemisphere. Uh, Messier struggled really hard to see this object. He was told it had existed from observations made from Cape Town and struggled for a long time to actually make his own observations of it, but did eventually find it himself from Paris and so was able to add it to his catalogue. The reason why globular clusters appear round is because they're intrinsically pretty spherical things. And the reason why they're spherical is largely because all the motions in them are completely random. There is no preferred direction in them. All the stars are all orbiting around in random directions, kind of like a swarm of bees. And there's this sort of trade-off in gravitating systems like this that the more random the motions are, the rounder it will appear. And as soon as you start having ordered motions, then actually things start appearing flatter. And so you can think about the extreme case of this is a system like the disk of the Milky Way, where all, everything's moving around on nice, neat, circular orbits, and that makes for a very thin disk. So this is trade-off. The more the orbits are ordered rather than random, the flatter the system becomes. Now, in this particular case, the object is, appears completely round. But what we don't know is whether it's intrinsically spherical, so it really is round in three dimensions, or whether it's actually somewhat flattened, but we just happen to be viewing it exactly face on. And then, you know, even a disc-like thing viewed exactly face on will appear round. And so we can't tell, just from a picture like that, whether it really is rotating at all and hence whether it's flattened or not. And from the traditional way that astronomers measure rotations of things, we're completely stuck because you rely on the Doppler shift, which only measures the line of sight motions of things, which means if a thing is completely face on, the stars are all just orbiting in the plane of the sky, which means that you don't see any motion towards you or away from you, so you don't see any Doppler shift, so we can't tell. But that's what's now changed, and it's changed because of this wonderful satellite called Gaia, which has been up there for a few years now, measuring very precisely the positions of lots and lots of stars, and then making repeated measurements of them. And from that, it can do various things. It can measure the distances to them, but the main thing that it can do that's useful to us is that it just tracks them over time very, very accurately, so you can actually see the individual stars move. So for the first time ever, we're not just restricted to the motions of stars away from us or towards us. We can actually see the movement of the stars on the plane of the sky. And so the later release number two from Gaia actually has enough data in it that we can actually monitor about 8,000 stars in this globular cluster. They're some of the stars that, that Gaia is following. And we can see how they're moving. And so you can actually tell for the first time ever whether this thing's actually rotating. There it is, Messier 55, otherwise known as NGC 6809. And this is, as you go away from the center of the galaxy, the movement of the stars. And you can see that actually, so this is this movement on the plane of the sky, and it's measured in these not very helpful units of milli arc seconds per year. But if you translate that into velocity, speeds, it works out that's about one kilometer per second. So you can see that as you work your way outwards, indeed, the stars in this thing are actually all rotating around. And as you go out, it stays more or less constant at around one kilometer per second as you work your way outwards. So indeed, it is rotating on the plane of the sky. From an astronomer's point of view, one kilometer per second is incredibly slow. So for example, the sun is going around the Milky Way at about 200 kilometers per second. So from that perspective, it's a very low speed. But these globular clusters, they're not very massive, which means the movements of stars are typically only a few kilometers per second. So this is actually you know, a, a normal kind of speed that you see things moving in a globular cluster. And it means some significant fraction of the motions of the stars in this globular cluster are actually rotation on the plane of the sky. And this is the first time we've ever actually been able to see this effect in systems like globular clusters that we can actually tell. Indeed, this system is rotating, which means it probably is somewhat flattened, but we can't see the flattening because all the flattening is that way rather than that way. So when you're measuring the motion of stars, what are you using as your reference point? Because everything's moving. It's really tough because, as you say, there are no fixed points. Very distant stars are obviously moving much less. Things are moving, appear to be moving more when they're closer to you. Um, very distant stars move much less. So in principle, you can use that partially as a reference frame. But then at some point, you actually want to tie things down to a real absolute reference frame. And one of the things the Gaia satellite does is it measures the positions of very distant quasars. So these very bright, very distant star-like objects. They really aren't moving on these kinds of timescales at all. So they are the ultimate thing that kind of ties down the reference frame and allows you to take the Gaia observations and sort of put them in the context of any other observation. So that's how the reference frame is ultimately tied down. How come we don't see really flat globular clusters then? Like, you know, the occasional one that is the right angle for us. They all seem pretty round. 
because actually, although that rotational motion is about one kilometer per second, the random motions are probably about three or four kilometers per second. And the thing that really dictates the flattening is that ratio, so about a factor of four or thereabouts. And in fact, it depends on that ratio squared. So actually, it's about a factor of 16. So actually, really, that, even though that rotation is significant, it's still a small fraction of the total motion of the stars. The motion is still dominated by random motions, which means it's still roughly round. So if I could like shimmy around the corner and get, look at a different angle of M55, it would still look pretty round. It would still look pretty round. It's actually one of the faster rotating globular clusters in terms of this valence between the ordered motions and the random motions. So it is a significant factor, but it's still basically going to be more or less round when you see it on the sky. Yeah. I mean, not looking at a pancake here. Right? Mm, very much not, no, no, just slightly flat. Right. So once they have formed, there's a couple of things that can happen. You get star-star interactions in a globular cluster, so you have like flybys of stars. It's not intended as a, a detailed reproduction of what's out there. It's a kind of cartoon view to kind of aid thinking. Right? And he's trying to figure out what I think, why it is you see these stars in certain directions on the sky.